so today we will discuss uh, or continue our uh, discussion on this concept of operators okay and so in the previous class we defined what is an operator what are the different properties of an of, of operators and what are the different types of operators okay remember operator this concept of operators forms a mathematical foundation okay for the formulation or the for the development of quantum mechanics we are uh, going to derive a very very important equation called schrodinger wave equation which would be helpful in describing the behavior of a microscopic particle okay and in order to develop the schrodinger wave equation we require to know this concept of operators in the previous class we had discussed about an important property of an of two operators called as commutative property okay so if a cross if a into b of f of x is equal to b into a of f of x then the two operators are said to commute with each other and if a into b is not equal to b into a the two operators do not commute with each other so in continuation with that property we will define a operator called as commutator operator okay a commutator operator is nothing but an operator defined for a given pair of operators a and b a commutator operator is represented by writing the two operators a and b within the square bracket separated by a comma and this commutator operator is defined as okay a into b operator a into b minus operator b into a so this is the definition of a commutator operator and it is also an operator in general if we have f of x as an arbitrary function then you can write the commutator operator is a b of f of x is equal to a of f of sorry a into b of f of x minus b into a of f of x okay so if you are asked to calculate what is the commutator operator you can be using this equation to calculate the commutator operator it is defined by any one of these two equation and an important property that is connected to this commutator operator is if operators a and b commute with each other okay if the two operators a and b okay, commute with each other what do you mean by commuting with each other that is a into b is equal to b into a then the commutator operator a b is nothing but a into b minus b into a is equal to a zero operator okay it is equal to zero or it is a zero operator so if the two operators commute with each other then the corresponding commutator operator will be equal to zero and it is true other ways also that is if the commutator operator for two operators a and b is equal to zero it means that a and b commute with each other and if the two operators a and b do not commute if they do not commute with each other then the commutator operator is not equal to zero so if the commutator operator is equal to zero it means the two operators commute with each other if the commutator operator is not equal to zero it means that the two operators do not commute with each other okay so we'll take some examples later and see whether the two operators are commuted uh, whether the two operators are commute uh, commute with each other or not okay by calculating the corresponding commutator operator we will leave the examples for the later session okay now i will move on to some other definitions that we require the next definition we should know is the definition of a well behaved function okay We are using 
different mathematical functions of the type f of x or f of x y or f of x y z. Okay, we are using different functions to describe the movement of an electron. Okay, in a, around the nucleus in an atom. Okay, we are using different types of mathematical function to describe the uh, system containing microscopic particles. Now, mathematically speaking, we can use any type of function, any type of function f of x, and we can operate that function by an operator. But in order to carry some physical meanings, okay, mathematically you can use any function. But in order to get some useful mathematical interpretation, or in order to get some significant physical interpretation, this function, mathematical function f of x that we will be using in quantum mechanics, it should have certain criteria, or it should have some uh, characteristics. Okay, so the functions that satisfy those characteristics are called as well-behaved function. So a function f of x is called a well-behaved function uh, if it satisfies certain criteria. What are those criteria? Let us list one by one. And in quantum mechanics, we are always using a well-behaved function and not any other function because we using a well-behaved function, it is possible to get some sort of physical interpretation about the system. So which function can be called as a well-behaved function? So a function can be called as a well-behaved function if it satisfies certain criteria. One is the well-behaved function should be a finite function. A well-behaved function should be a finite function. What does it mean? For any values of x, the function f of x should always take finite values only. It cannot take infinite values. I will give some examples. Okay. Say for example, f of x is equal to sin x f of x is equal to sin x is it a finite function for all values of x the answer is s whatever the value of x i substitute the value of sin x okay always varies between minus 1 and plus 1 for all values of x so whatever values of x i substitute whether x is equal to 0 or x is equal to 45 degree that is pi by 4 or x is equal to 90 degree that is pi by 2 or x is equal to 180 degree that is pi or 270 degree whatever value of x i substitute the value of this function sin x varies between minus 1 to plus 1 that is it varies between uh, finite values for all values of x therefore this is an example for a finite function if i take f of x is equal to 1 over x 1 divided by x this is not an example for finite function. This is an example for a finite function. This is not for a uh, example for finite function because this f of x becomes infinite because this function takes an infinite value when x is equal to 0. Okay. So though this function is finite for all other values of x, it becomes infinite when x is equal to 0. So this is not a finite function for all values of x. Okay, So a well-behaved function should satisfy this condition that it should be a finite function. The second function is uh, criteria is that it should be a continuous function. Okay, it should be a continuous function. What is the definition of continuity or continuous function? You might have studied in your mathematics class. I will not uh, mathematics class. Okay, I will not discuss it again here. Okay, what do you mean by a continuous function? Okay, I will only give you the physical meaning of it, not the mathematical definition. So a function is called as a continuous function if it varies smoothly or if it varies very slowly as you change the value of x. Say for example y is equal to f of x is a function so y is a function of x so as i change the value of x the value of y that is the value of f of x should also change very very gradually or slowly so the graph should be a very smooth function such type of functions are called as continuous function for example f of x is equal to sin x or f of x is equal to cos x Okay, or all are example for continuous function. The third important criteria a well-behaved function should satisfy it is that it should be a single-valued function. 
if I substitute a value of x, f of x should give only one value. Okay, it should not give more than one value. That is property is called a single valued property. So a well behaved function should be a single valued function. For example, if I take f of x is equal to uh, one by x. Okay, of course this is this is not a finite function. Okay, but we are checking here only whether it is single valued or not. The answer is it is a single valued function because if I substitute one value of x, f of x can give only one result. Suppose if I substitute x is equal to 1, that is only one outcome that is f of x is also equal to 1. If I substitute x is equal to 2 here, what is the value of f of x? 1 divided by 2 that is 0.5. So if I substitute one value of x, okay, f of x also has only single value. So such functions are called single valued function. So this is a single valued function. But if I take the example of f of x is equal to square root of x, f of x is equal to square root of x. This is not a single valued function. This is not a single valued function. Why? Because if I substitute a number here, say for example x is equal to 9. Okay. So square root of 9 gives two values plus or minus 3. So if I substitute a value of x here f of x has two possible values plus or minus 3 therefore this is actually not a single valued function because for each value of x f of x has two possible results so this square root of x is not a single valued function so a well behaved function that we will be using in quantum mechanics should satisfy these three criteria one it should be finite it should be continuous and it should be single valued why these properties should be satisfied we will come to know later after solving Schrodinger wave equation. Okay, when we discuss about wave function and its characteristics, we will come to know why these conditions are uh, has to be met. Okay, and there is one more condition that I will not discuss now, but I will only point out here is that a well behaved function should also be a a normalized function a well behaved function should also be a normalized function what is this normalization and what do you mean by normalization condition we will discuss later so these are the characteristics of a well behaved function as i already told you in quantum mechanics the mathematical function that we will be using to describe the behavior of a microscopic system should be a well behaved function along with this uh, criteria a well behaved function generally satisfies another important condition that that it should be a eigen function of the operator i repeat okay so we are in a hunt of such functions mathematical functions which are not only a uh, not only well behaved functions but they should also be an eigen function of the corresponding operator so what do you mean by eigen function let us try to define and understand okay So what is an eigen function and what is it what is its eigen value okay suppose if i have an operator a okay you have an operator a is an operator and i have a well behaved function okay f of x A well behaved function or a well behaved operand what do you mean by operand it is a function on which the operator is applied okay now this well behaved function can also be called as an eigen function of this operator a if applying the operator on the function okay listen carefully applying the operator on the function gives back the same function it returns back the same function multiplied by a constant c okay then this this condition is satisfied then this function f of x is nothing but 
an eigen function it is an eigen function of this particular operator a okay i repeat if operator a applied on the function f of x gives back the same function but multiplied by a constant then that function is called an eigen function of that particular operator a and this constant c that is obtained by applying this operator equation is nothing but called as eigen value of the operator a that constant value that we get is called an eigen value of operator a okay so let me give one or two examples okay from that you will understand the concept of eigen function say for example let me select a is equal to d by dx is the operator okay and f of x is equal to sin x okay I will take it as f1 of x and I will give one more function f2 of x is equal to e to the power 2x okay I will take it as operator the first operator because I will give one more operator for you operator a2 is d square by dx square okay so we have two operators a1 and a2 that is d by dx and d square by dx square and you have two well behaved functions okay actually this is not a well behaved function but still let me take this example for describing eigen function okay so we have two functions f1 of x and f2 of x defined as sin x and e to the power 2x let us first calculate a1 of f1 of x that is the first operator is applied on the first function that is d by dx of sin x which is cos x okay let me let us first calculate all the four okay this let us look at the, and interpret the result later the second is operator a the first operator is applied on the second function that is d by dx of e to the power 2x okay and uh, i hope you know the rules of differentiation this is 2 into e to the power 2x let us work out the third operator equation that is the second operator is applied on the first function so this is d square by dx square of sin x so you are now you have to apply the differentiation two times the first differentiation of sin x gives cos x the second differentiation okay on, on cos x will give minus sin x okay the fourth result that is the second operator applied on the second function is d square by dx square of e to the power 2x so again we have to apply differentiation twice on this function first differentiation will give 2 into e to the power 2x the second differentiation will be 2 into 2 into e to the power 2x so the result is 4 into e to the power 2x now let us try to figure out the result okay here the original function was sin x but the end result okay is a different function cos x so this is not equal to constant into f1 of x this is not equal to constant into f1 of x that is we are not getting the same function back what about here the original function is e to the power 2x here also we are getting e to the power 2x multiplied by a constant number that is 2 so this is of the form c into f2 of x we are getting back the original function what about here the original function was sin x here also we are having sin x multiplied by minus 1 so this is also equal to c into f1 of x whereas in the last case e to the power 2x is the original function and we are getting back that original function multiplied by a constant so this is also of the form c into f2 of x so in three out of the four cases we see that the function is actually an eigen function of that particular operator for example in the from first example we see that sin x is not an eigen function of operator a but e to the power 2x is an eigen function of operator a 
So understand one function may not be an eigen function of an operator, but another function may be an eigen function of operator. For example, sin x is not an eigen function of d by dx, but e to the power 2x can be an eigen function of d by dx. And what is the eigen value in the second example? That constant is nothing but equal to 2. So you can say that e to the power 2x is an eigen function of d by dx with eigen value equal to 2. Similarly, if you look at the third and the fourth example, is in both the cases we are getting back the same function multiplied by a constant. So we can say that sin x is an eigen function of d square by dx square with eigen value c is equal to minus 1. And in the fourth case, e to the power 2x is also an eigen function of d square by dx square with an eigen value equal to 4. So in this case, in the second case, both the functions sin x and e to the power 2x were the eigen functions of the operator a2 but in the first case only e to the power 2x is the eigen function but not sin x okay of the particular operator d by dx so remember two points for a given operator if one function is not an eigen function it does not mean that other function may not be the eigen function sin x may not be the eigen function but there are other functions e to the power 2x which are the eigen functions of d by dx so the second point you have to remember is if a function is not an eigen function of a particular operator it does not mean that it cannot be an eigen function for any other operator okay for example sin x is not an eigen function of d by dx but still it is an eigen function of d square by dx square so whether a given function is an eigen function of a particular operator a is decided by the characteristic of both the operator as well as the function so both the operator as well as the function together decide whether the given function is an eigen function or not so it is easy to find out whether a particular function is eigen function or not and if the function is an eigen function you can also calculate what are the eigen values okay we will take some more problems later for now it is okay uh, mandatory to know what are the definitions of eigen functions and eigen value to end with this concept of operator we have to define one very important property of operator that is called as hermitian property of operator so any operator that will be using in quantum chemistry calculations should ha have two characteristics in the last class i told you one characteristic that is an operator should be a linear operator all the operators that we use in quantum chemistry are only linear operators that is one characteristic another important characteristic uh, the operator should uh, satisfy is it should be an Hermitian operator so in quantum chemistry we use only a linear Hermitian operator so what do you mean by Hermitian operator? Let us define the uh, definition of Hermitian property of an operator or an Hermitian operator. So, you can uh, name it as Hermitian property of an operator or an Hermitian operator. Okay. So, suppose you have an operator A. Okay. You have an operator A. This is an operator. And you have two functions f of x and g of x. Okay. You have two functions f of x and g of x which are eigen functions of the operator okay so the two functions that we are using are the eigen functions of the operator then a is a 
Hermitian operator A is called a Hermitian operator if it satisfies this particular condition integration okay you can use minus infinity to plus infinity or the value of this integration limit okay may change depending on the nature of the system the value of this integration limit may change so minus infinity to plus infinity uh, f of x okay a cap of g of x into dx f of x a cap g of x into dx is equal to integration minus infinity to plus infinity a cap of f of x into g of x okay here look at the into dx okay so look at what we have done here in the lhs the operator a is applied on the function g of x and f of x is free from any operator okay whereas here the operator a is applied on f of x and g of x is free from any operator so i have just interchanged the function on which the operator is applying so if this condition is satisfied then that such type of operator is called as hermitian operator or this condition is called as hermitian condition okay this is true if the functions f of x and g of x are real functions if they are real functions then this condition has to be satisfied now suppose if one of them or both the functions are complex functions okay complex function containing imaginary terms so i okay for example e to the power x is a real function e to the power i into x is a complex function where what is i i is square root of minus 1 an imaginary number so if one or both the functions are complex function then the condition is integration minus infinity to plus infinity f of x star okay what does the star represent star represents the complex conjugate of the function f of x f of x star into a of g of x into dx is equal to integration minus infinity to plus infinity a of f of x whole star into g of x into dx okay and this condition okay is called as hermitian condition for operator a if the functions f of x and g of x are complex function so what does the star represent the star represents the complex conjugate of the function what do you mean by complex conjugate suppose if i have a function f of x is equal to e to the power i into x this is a complex function because we have this imaginary number i what is the complex conjugate of this num function f of x star is you are just changing the sign of the imaginary number okay in the function so since here i the imaginary number appears as plus so i have to interchange the sign and write it as e to the power minus i x so this function is the complex conjugate of function f of x i will give one more example if f of x is equal to um, e to the power minus 2 i into x this is a complex function now how will you write the complex conjugate of this function f star of x that is e to the power here you have minus sign associated with the imaginary number you have to interchange it make it plus so it is over 2i into x is the complex conjugate function okay so these conditions are nothing but called as hermitian condition now the question is okay one more point i have to say here so how we have changed the operator that is very very important in the lhs the operator is applied on the first function okay whereas the second function appears as the complex conjugate here the operator is applied on the second function with its complex conjugate and the second function is now free from the operator here the first function was uh, sorry the 
second function was free from the operator here the first function is free from operator here the second function complex conjugate was taken here also the complex conjugate of the same function is taken but it is now applied by an operator so any one of this condition is called as hermitian condition depending on whether the function is a real or a complex function now the question is why this type of mathematical condition should be put to define this hermitian condition or to ask it in a very simple way why should an operator should be an hermitian operator okay by defining like this very complicated definition okay what is the purpose of defining by a very complicated manner there is a reason why we define hermitian operator like this because there is a valid reason because if this type of conditions are set up or if this type of conditions are set these conditions you a very very important property for the operator what are those two important properties let us try to understand so by setting these type of conditions we are introducing some important characteristic features into operators what are those two important characteristic features let us try to understand so the two important characteristic feature of an hermitian operator is properties of a hermitian operator there are two important properties of hermitian proper uh, of an hermitian operator and these two properties are the result of the conditions that we defined earlier okay so a condition now we fix made the hermitian condition anta a condition in a result enu these two properties and these two are very very important properties which we wanted ideally wanted for an operator to have so that is why we defined the hermitian condition like that okay so the first important property of an hermitian operator is the eigen value the eigen value of a hermitian operator operator is always a real number okay the eigen value of an hermitian operator sorry is yes, hermitian operator is always real the function may be the function f of x or g of x that i am using function may be a real or complex in nature okay the functions that i'm uh, that i'm using may be a real function or a complex function but the eigen value is always real what does it mean suppose if i have a operator a which is a hermitian operator and if i apply it on a eigen function f of x this is an eigen function of this hermitian operator and according to the definition of eigen function what does it do okay when an operator is applied on the eigen function it gives back the same function multiplied by a constant okay but if this okay this constant can be a real number or a complex number okay it depends on a and f of x this may be a real number or a complex number but if a is a hermitian operator satisfying the condition that we mentioned in the previous slide if a is a hermitian operator then this number c is always a real number irrespective of whether the function is a real function or complex function remember in physics or in chemistry we use functions okay to describe the nature of the system and this function may be sometimes real and sometimes complex okay whatever the function whether it is a real function or a complex function after dealing mathematically with that function finally if you are calculating some property for example if you are calculating energy or if you are calculating position or if you are calculating momentum those numbers or values cannot be a complex number okay a uh, physical quantity can only take uh, real values not complex values for example what is the energy of a system you say energy is 10 joules you never say energy is 10 plus i into 4 joules energy is not a complex number energy is a 
real number so all the values of physical quantities are real numbers so that is why this function can be a complex function or a real function but the eigen values that we will get should be a real real number and remember we will learn it in future these eigen values represent the values of different type of physical quantity this eigen value may represent the energy value this eigen value may represent momentum or this eigen value may represent position this eigen value may represent angular momentum depending on the operator so this represents the value of a physical quantity and that should always be real number and when and how can i get a real number i can always get a real number if the operator a is a hermitian operator okay and for that i have to use the condition of uh, the hermitian operator that we defined uh, in the earlier slide so condition a tar set madidre matra we can get this property okay the second important property of an hermitian operator is if we have two functions two eigen functions okay f of x and g of x of the operator a suppose if i have two eigen functions f of x and g of x of an hermitian operator a with different eigen values okay if i have two eigen functions of the hermitian operator a with the different eigen values then the eigen functions are orthogonal to each other okay so what is this orthogonal orthogonal condition is given by this mathematical condition that is integration minus infinity to plus infinity product of f of x into g of x should be equal to 0 okay so integration minus infinity to plus infinity product of the two functions f of x into g of x into dx is equal to 0 this condition is the mathematical condition for orthogonality okay so two functions are orthogonal to each other if they satisfy this condition so two functions eigen functions of an hermitian operator a with the different eigen values are orthogonal to each other remember this is important they should have different eigen values so what is the meaning of this orthogonal condition it means that both f of x and g of x cannot be non zero for a particular value of x i repeat both f of x and g of x cannot be simultaneously non zero for a given value of x to simplify what i have said now if i substitute a value of x okay then either f of x should be zero or g of x should be zero or both should be equal to zero then only you can get the final result zero so when i substitute a value of x either one of the function should become zero in value or both may become zero in value but both cannot be non zero okay so what is the physical interpretation of this condition we will discuss later but remember that the two functions with the different eigen values will be orthogonal to each other if uh, the operator is a sir, hermitian operator so these are the two important properties of an hermitian operator in the next class we will solve some numerical problems uh, right from the beginning of, of definition of operators up to hermitian property of operators so that you will get into uh, the real understanding of this concept of operators